Good. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with uh, my friend Martin um, uh, and to be talking to him for the next half an hour, 40 minutes before we open it up to, to, to I'm sure, a very talkative uh, audience um, about this extremely ambitious um, and compelling um, book. Um, Martin can explain the book much better than, than I can, um, but sometimes it's useful to, well, it's useful for the author to have someone other than the author doing that. Um, uh, that's how I get my paycheck. Um, <laughs> Um, let me put it like this. I was at a conference um, last year at, in Saratoga Springs uh, about literature and belief. And um, I was a day late, and so I missed Marilyn Robinson's keynote address. And when I got there, um, the place was a buzz with uh, conference members who were um, aghast that Marilyn Robinson, in her speech had posed the following question. Um, she said something to the effect of, uh, is it possible uh, that I have not yet seen a rich account of the atheistical life? Um, and all the conference members uh, rushed to me and said, you have to defend the atheistic life. Uh, you have to do the counterpoint to, uh, to Marilyn Robinson. Um, we only have to think, of course, of uh, literary tradition, um, say, most of Montaigne. How would that be? Uh, a great deal of Chekhov? How's that as a reply? Um, what about Jose Saramago's um, novel Death with Interruptions, which is precisely uh, about a, a kind of fictional thought experiment in which, uh, in which um, no, no one uh, dies any any longer, um, and suddenly everyone realizes actually it's very important to die. Um, but it seems to me this uh, is uh, the book that I needed to wave in the face of Marilyn Robinson, uh, much as I admire her as a as a novelist, um, because Martin Hegland is um, working both at a fine grained level. Uh, there are readings of. St. Augustine, C.S. Lewis, Kierkegaard, a uh, long reading uh, uh, of Marx, uh, and a final beautiful conclusion uh, about Martin Luther King. Um, but also at, at uh, uh, an ambitious and exciting um, theoretical uh, level. Um, and um, lest that sound daunting, it, it is daunting. It, it's a, it, this, is a, this is a demanding and complex book. It's also quite simple at its heart. And the simplicity, um, well, you'll hear the simplicity. The simplicity is the following. Uh, religious faith is premised on infinity, uh, eternity, in one form or another. Um, uh, the working definition that Martin Hegland uses is this. Any form of belief in an eternal being or an eternity beyond being um, either in the form of a timeless repose, such as nirvana, or a transcendent god, or an imminent divine nature. Religious faith is premised on eternity, infinity, um, and subordinates the finite to the infinite. Secular faith is premised on finitude, on uh, the fact that everything ends. And Hegland goes on to make the argument not only that, but of course that it is finitude that makes life intelligible. Um, and that actually, if we stop to think about it, eternity uh, is not uh, intelligible or coherent um, in, any, uh, in any meaningful way. It's finitude, it's the fact that things end uh, that creates value uh, and that uh, makes us um, put our faith, and it is a faith, of course, in, um, in mortal life. To keep faith, he writes, in mortal life is to remain vulnerable to a pain, a, a pain that no st strength can finally master. We believe that life is worth living. This is a matter of faith because we cannot prove that life is worth living despite all the suffering it entails. Um, I think that the book is very 
consonant with one of my favorite texts, and I think it doesn't actually appear in, uh, in Martin's book, and that's Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus, um, which also argues, of course, those of you who read it will know very well, um, for a kind of rival, uh, a rival faith, a kind of rival, rival absurdity uh, to Kierkegaard's uh, absurdity of religious faith. Um, uh, the difference being, perhaps we can get into this, uh, that, uh, that Camus in the end uh, argues for um, the importance of a greater uh, 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 quantity of life, whereas you argue for, I think, the, the greater quality of, uh, of life in terms of uh, freedom. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that. Um, I'm going to st start asking you by uh, perhaps just Perhaps you just expand on on, on the sort of basic uh, principles I've laid out, or, or, the, or the basic sort of dichotomy: uh, religious faith premised on uh, infinity and eternity, uh, a secular faith based on precisely the opposite. Yeah. So, is this on? Um, I attempt to pro oh, yeah, so I attempt to project. I was going to say, but then I had some technological aid immediately. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, James, for for those opening remarks. Um, I mean, uh, this book, as, as as James mentioned, like it really ranges across uh, a lot of different material, a lot of different questions. But really, what unites the book is how we should think about our affinity. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to speak into this mic. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and. Uh, you know, to be finite very simply is, is to, uh, you know, uh, essentially depend on others and uh, to live in relation to death. So I'm like finite because I can't maintain my life on my own and because I'm going to die. And really the, the book wants to ask the question about like how should we see our finitude? Everyone knows that we're finite in a certain sense. Yeah. Uh, but how should we judge that fact? How should we see it? And, uh, you know, the common denominator for what I'm calling a religious understanding of finitude is one that like, in one way or another, sees it as a lack or privation or fallen condition that like, the fact that we're finite uh, somehow testifies to that, that uh, uh, something is lacking or missing, you know, and you can have that understanding even if you don't have religious faith. Uh, many secular people would still write that. And part of what the book is trying to show is actually like, even though it is painful and difficult to be finite, uh, that's also the condition for anything mattering, anything being at stake, anything uh, uh, being uh, valuable and worth caring about. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to just to pick up on that, I mean, I'm, I was really struck in your reading of Charles Taylor, um, how easily you brush him aside in a way. Um, I mean, all you need to quote is uh, Taylor saying that we have an irrepressible craving for eternity, and to simply point out that that is. It may be true about many people, but it's also not true about many people, right? I mean, I don't have an irrepressible craving for eternity. I have an absolute horror of eternity. Um, and once you actually begin to think about the implications of, of eternity, I don't think you have an irrepressible desire for it. But I, I simply raise that as a yeah, as an example of, of the kind you said. You don't have to be a formal religious believer to be yeah. rather enamored of eternity. Yeah. Um, and whatever uh, Taylor is a more formal believer, but but but. Yeah, sure. I mean that's a very helpful. Wayne, one one reason why Taylor's work on a secular age is important to the book is that he articulates very clearly uh, this idea that's shared by many that uh, there is some sort of both existential and normative deficit inherent right. in the secular life. Uh, just as there's a deficit in my mic somehow. Uh, but want, hang on, I'm I'm not so important, okay. so you All right. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so. Uh, and would you would you do me a favor and just for the crowd just take that back to Max Weber, in the way that you do in your that that idea yeah that there's something lacking yeah. uh, in 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 modern uh, secular life yeah and Weber's term for this was disenchantment uh, so that there's you know this nostalgic sense that like well the world used to be really glowing and meaningful and now we've lost that because we've lost religion and we're secular uh, and my point vis-a-vis -vis that is not to say. Everything is great about our current state of secularization, but rather that like what we're missing uh, is not uh, religious faith or some sort of supernatural. What we're missing are social and institutional forms that would that enable us to lead flourishing lives. Um, and part of taking that on is also seeing that like uh, trying to counter in various ways this narrative that that. Uh, 
because that, that a lifetime of sense itself as finite and without religious redemption is somehow lacking. Um, and very importantly, um, I should also say that uh, when Taylor articulates that, as you could in terms of an irrepressible craving for eternity, it's not just that I brush that aside in a way, I also try to show that like, when we talk about the desire for eternity, we can mean two very different things. And Taylor sort of talks about them at the same time, but I think it's very important to distinguish them. One is to say, uh, oh, we have a desire for eternity because we would want to be in a state of being that is beyond death, beyond time. Uh, that's one notion, that's what I'm calling the religious notion. Yeah. But actually, a lot of the examples that Taylor gives and a lot of the people think people think about when they when they think that we desire eternity are things like well uh, we would want to live on you know we, we want to you know uh, counteract the destruction of uh, time and memory and uh, live on in various ways for the things we do and one of the things I'm trying to show is that you know the desire to live on shouldn't be conflated with the desire for eternity uh, so. Uh, all sorts of ways in which we try to prolong our lives or the lives of what we love yeah. or the ways in which we're committed to the living on of the institutions to which we're committed or uh, the social forms of life to which we're committed uh, these days the, you know, the very living on of the earth itself all of those things shouldn't be understood as uh, expressing a religious type of eternity their commitment to prolonging yes. finite and fragile forms of life <laughs> absolutely, no, I mean that's something there's something I love, you know, in, in, in John Stuart Mill's sort of idea of the religion of humanity. Um, it, it's a deliberate, liberal, secular attempt to say, this is how you make, you, you pass something on. You pass it on through work, or through children, uh, through books, through, uh, through the progress of, uh, of a collective uh, life. Um, and that is a prolongation. That's, that's you're, you're extending something, uh, perhaps infinitely, um, but it's not a formal religious definition of eternity. And it's also very importantly, like, <clears throat> when something lives on, no matter how long it lives on, it can always fall apart, it can always get, uh, be lost, or, and, and that's part of what animates the commitment to sustaining it. And that dynamic is what I'm talking about in terms of the dynamic of secular faith, that you at one and the same time, you're committed to the intrinsic value of something, but you also apprehend its fragility, uh, and it's precisely because it can be lost that it requires yeah. our sustained commitments. Let's Let's just ground this in, um, uh, the, the book has three, the first part of the book has three readings, very interesting readings uh, of uh, religious writers, uh, C.S. Lewis, St. Augustine, and Kierkegaard. Um, the, we could start with the Lewis in a way because it's, it's, it's the first one, um, so we'll start with the Lewis. Um, the, you do a wonderful reading of Lewis's um, well-known memoir, Grief Observed, um, about having to, you know, his short marriage and uh, witnessing the, the, the premature death of, it, of, of his wife. Um, and you point out um, that, of course, Lewis's book is, what's poignant about it is it's extremely alive to, to loss. Yeah. Um, and it's extremely alive to how uh, um, religious faith does not console us. Uh, in the face of loss, and how indeed um, the idea of um, eternity, or to use Marilyn Robinson's favorite word, restoration, yeah. um, does not console us in the face of loss. In fact, the example you quote from Lewis is a very moving one in which he says, you know, if a mother loses her child uh, and is a strong believer, um, she could be consoled at the level of being a believer. She can sort of say, glory to God, I lost my child. What she can't be consoled at as is as a mother. She won't have that experience again. And Lewis is quite emphatic about that, how it, she won't have it either obviously on earth or anywhere else right. as a mother. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so, I mean, so I mean, one of the reasons that's important in the book, will people hear me if I talk like this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, it's just really crossing off with my... One of the reasons that's important for the book is because it's a very vivid, lived account of the distinction between what I'm calling a secular commitment to living on, a secular commitment to finite life, and a religious commitment to eternity. Yeah. Because very interestingly, like, the crisis that Lewis experiences in mourning, it's not that he starts doubting the existence of God or eternity, it's a deeper problem. It, because he's confronted with the fact that like, 
even if there is God in eternity, it actually can't give me what I want, namely for us, our life together, to continue. Uh, so it's not even in principle a consolation. Yeah. Uh, and that's very important for my whole argument, because there's one strand of secular thinking that says, like, well, if we give up the idea of eternity, then we should just be reconciled with the fact that we die, and we should be relieved from our anxiety before death. That's not my position at all. I'm just trying to give a different kind of what animates that anxiety and that pain. That is actually the commitment to uh, sustaining a finite life, sustaining a further life together. Yeah. Uh, and that's not something we should overcome, uh, but that's something we should own. That's like it's an essential part of a life that matters. Uh, that you're actually anxious about the possibility of loss, anxious about the question what you should do with your finite time. Right. Uh, so that's very different from like a whole strand of secular thinking that really begins with a purist <coughs> uh, where where the point of overcoming religious ideas of the afterlife is then just to uh, be uh, overcome the fear of death. But I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Um, the, I wonder if, you, if, if I could just get you to read actually the passage, um, the passage in which Lewis talks about about Joy Davidman's Davidman's last um, breath, really, and then your commentary on that, uh, which I think is is quite beautifully done. Um. <clears throat> and it should also be said that this is to the context. This is chapter. I really because one thing I'm trying to do too is to take uh, religious texts and religious traditions very seriously and read them in a different way from within. So in this chapter. The, the, the most powerful testimonies come from uh, Lewis, C.S. Lewis losing his wife, Martin Luther writing these incredible letters in the 16th century about the death of his daughter, uh, and when he's so like, you know, <laughs> really in this moving confessional way, so it's like, yeah, I know that she's to the glory of God, but like somehow he doesn't, that's my thing. Uh, um, yeah, so, but I can, I can read them. Yeah. Yeah, what about the bottom sixty-four and then your commentary? So this is the block quote, you mean? Uh, to the paragraph beginning, hence it is all the more striking that the scene Lewis presents on the final page. Right. Right. Um, Yeah, yes, yeah. okay, so just to put this in context, this, he, he first has a scene that I won't read, which is uh, on her deathbed when she says, you know, like, you know, if you can, if it's allowed, come to me too when, you know, I'm on your deathbed, that's what he tells mm -hmm. her, and she says, like, well, heaven would have a big job trying to stop me from doing this, and it's this real affirmation of their bond, you know, um, even in sort of opposition to the harmony of heaven. Yeah. And I so juxtapose that with what is supposed to be the sort of uh, religious conciliatory ending of the, of the book. And, and, um, on James' recommendation, I'll read this then. Uh, so hence, the contrast to that scene, it is all the more striking that the scene Lewis presents on the final page as the religious resolution marks the breaking of the will that binds he and his wife together. <laughs> Uh, in direct contrast to the deathbed scene where that bond is affirmed, the last lines of the book celebrate her pious renunciation of the will to be with him. Here's what he writes. She said not to me, but to the chaplain, I am at peace with God. She smiled, but not at me. Poi si torno all'eterna fontana. So the line that Lewis quotes in Italian here, as the very last sentence of the book, is a quotation from the final canto of Dante's Paradiso, and reads in translation, then she turned toward the eternal fountain. So that's the scene when Dante's beloved Beatrice, after having guided him in the ascent to heaven, turns away from him toward the glory of God. Mm. Beatrice thus achieves the state of beatitude, the complete bliss of contemplating the radiance of God, which according to Dante, is the ultimate fulfillment of desire. As that light strikes us, Dante emphasizes, we are transformed in such a way that we cannot, this would be impossible, consent to turn and seek some other phase. I mean, that's the radiance of, of being absorbed by the light of God. Thus, even though Beatrice is love of Dante's life, and vice versa, the supposed fulfillment of their desires is a state of being in which they no longer even care to turn toward one another. There is no Dante in Beatrice's beatitude, and no Beatrice in Dante's beatitude. <laughs> 
by analogy, there is no C.S. Lewis for the Joy Davidman in heaven and no Joy Davidman for C.S. Lewis. Even their own individual identities can no longer be said to exist, since they are unable to do anything except be absorbed by the radiance of God. This religious consummation does not fulfill the wishes that animate their love and their lives. It rather obliterates them as they are literally lost in the rapture of God. Yeah. So, you know, what I like about, about this reading and the, and, the, and the chapter you have on, on Augustine is, as you say, you, you, you go into the contradiction. I mean, you, it's not simply that you, um, that you point out that these writers are uh, vulnerable to secular loss like, like anyone uh, human, um, but that you then go on to point out that, that this opens up a, f a fundamental incompatibility uh, between their between their religious belief and, and, and that human loss. Is that, is that fair? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's tied to the importance of the book in general because uh, I'm not uh, simply opposing secular faith to religious faith, or I'm trying to show that like even for those who identify as religious, there is a deeper secular faith that, faith that animates care and commitment, you know, and that, and that we can come to recognize as the real source of value. Right. Um, well, Let's let's think a little bit about that because um, we're, we're jumping ahead a bit, and I, and I don't want to miss the, the, the important stuff about Marx and capitalism and freedom and and and, and time. But the book ends with a with a beautiful chapter about Martin Luther King, uh, in particular his uh, his final speech, his final speech of his, uh, of his life, in which. He seems quite deliberately to to move away from from a new Jerusalem to, as it were, a new Memphis, yeah. right? Um, and you do something which uh, seems, on the face of it, scandalously counterintuitive. Um, you take the you know the great late twentieth century or mid twentieth century pastor and religious leader, yeah. and you effectively out the secularist in him. That's, that's to say, you apply to, to, to Martin Luther King the sort of reading you do on Lewis and Augustine, which is you say, whatever his profession of faith, his actual faith was a secular one rather than a religious one. Um, you can see the scandal in that. Uh, do you want to defend it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, there's several aspects to that. I mean. Um, one reason that's important is throughout the book, I'm also trying to provide the resources of distinguishing within uh, religious language and religious practices between those who actually espouse commitments mm. that pertain to our life together and building community versus those who pertain to like the aspiration to eternity. Right. So, so very important. I mean, the conclusion is really about King and Hegel because Hegel had the uh, the secular understanding of, of, of Christian faith, where he was trying to show that you know. Uh, in practice, the actual object of devotion is the congregation itself. You know, so what really matters about coming together in rituals against birth, around birth and death, and it's like acknowledging uh, one another's dignity and holding one another to our commitment to the life we're trying to build together. Yeah. Uh, and Hegel thought that sort of the religious misunderstanding of that was to think that like you know, the real object of devotion is something that goes beyond the the our side of life together. Uh, and it's really devoted to the salvation that like goes beyond that or God beyond that. But that there are the resources to recognize that actually what is the highest good is our better life together and what animates uh, and requires us to to uh, sustain our commitments is that like that only exists in the part we do it. And I'm trying to show right. that that's the insight that right. there is in, in King. But I, I want to, but I want to nail you down here. Yeah. I mean you you're saying, just leave King aside for a moment, but, but, but it's a, a, a general argument. You would, you, would, you, make, you would make the following argument. Of course religious people uh, can have, um, uh, I mean, you're not dismissing, of course religious people can care about um, uh, climate change yeah. while also believing in eternity, yeah? You, you, that, right, that's not, that you don't yeah. de deny that. Um, you would simply point out that their caring about climate change and the fate of the world is itself a secular faith and not a religious faith and doesn't need to be premised on 
what you define as religious faith. Does yeah, and you can start with canopy premise on it, because, you know, sure, right. canopy aspects, premise. I mean, just to, we haven't got this enough, I guess, I mean, uh, one aspect is that in secular faith, you know, uh, you at one and the same time, what you're committed to, you recognize it's inherently valuable, but also that it's valuable and finite, you know, and that's otherwise, you would need to care about it, and obviously, like, right. the of the earth is a good example of that. Uh, but then the other important difference is that, like, uh, in secular faith, the object of faith is dependent on the practice of faith. You know, so whatever we're committed to, uh, the life we're trying to lead, the institutions we're trying to build, the community we're trying to sustain, uh, those objects of faith, those ends for the sake of which we lead our lives, mm. they only exist insofar as people are committed to them and sustain those practices. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas what I'm defining as religious faith is the idea that like you know the ultimate there's a special object of faith that ultimately is independent of the practice and even if uh, right. uh, and that was just, uh, live beyond it yeah yeah no that seems I I, I, I like that a lot um, your I mean your reading of Augustine is 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 wonderful I think because you point out that Augustine's essential deep notion uh, <laughs> of of time is one of Finite fragility. That's to say, the present moment is always is always receding into the past. Right? We're always always in the we're always poised between future and uh, and and past. Um, and that um, I think this is generally true about certainly Augustine's Confessions. Um, that of course, at one level, at one level, it's a it's a beautifully um, deep uh, account about growing up, about being an ordinary kid about having sexual desire, uh, about memory and time, with the proviso that all that is to be subordinate to um, a, a final and ultimate conversion to uh, values, uh, uh, infinite values, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and part of the point of, of reading these religious texts in this way is, that, is to show that even within them, the, the most expressive resources yeah. for uh, uh, understanding the exigencies of the commitments and the values and the lives we find to lead are actually better understood in what Augustine himself calls secular right. terms. Right. I mean, the way I distinguish between religious and secular really comes from Augustine because he, he makes that distinction very clearly. Like, the secular is that which is essentially historical, essentially temporal, uh, uh, whereas the, the religious is not yeah. that which. And this is just, this is exactly what I like about the book because a lot of the, a, a lot of the sort of popular, uh, um, literature of secularism in the last few years has been a kind of rearguard attempt. I mean, I reviewed a book called The Joy of Secularism a few years ago, a sort of rearguard attempt to sort of go to go to the, to the religious and say, ah, we secularists can lead, lead fulfilled lives. Here's how, you know, we can go for walks in the woods. We can uh, look at butterflies and listen to music. Um, and you, you, you get round that by saying, we don't even have to do that. It's simply enough to say, uh, that because our lives will end, we cherish what we have, and then further to, to point out that a great deal of the notion of religious fulfillment actually turns out to be secular fulfillment, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I mean, that also belongs to like a larger strategy of the book. Instead of trying to debunk, uh, you know, religious faith <coughs> with secular knowledge or religious values with secular facts, mm -hmm. I'm trying to like have a more fundamental conversation, just ask yourself, like, what do we believe, what do we value, what is the dynamic of those beliefs and that value, and in making an account, giving an account of why uh, uh, a secular perspective actually is more expressive of what we believe and what we value. Yeah. And, and that's also why it's so important to read uh, all of these religious authors and texts too, to show that like, there are resources for making that argument within those texts. Well. Right, right. Um, well, since you're talking about what we value, um, we could turn to the second part of the book, uh, in which you began begin to open out uh, away from critique and towards uh, you know a, a positive idea uh, of what uh, of, of what our existence should look like. Um, do you want to just talk about what you what you premise that on, and just talk about freedom a bit and, and the centrality of freedom to your to your reading? Yeah. So I mean, this might be the juncture to say something about the other uh, concept in the subtitle, what I'm calling spiritual freedom. Because just as I'm trying to rethink the notion of faith, I'm also trying to rethink what we mean by the spiritual, which, you know, 
a lot of people might think as some sort of uh, state of contemplative detachment or something supernatural. Right. Whereas, but I would say, like, you know, the ability to lead a spiritual life hinges on the question that you're able to engage the question what is worth doing with your time, that you're actually able to pose that question uh, and thereby uh, ask what is worth doing. And I'm trying to show that, like, only someone who understands themselves as finite can even be gripped by that question. Right. So actually, like, a spiritual life has to be fragile, materially embodied, and finite for there to be anything at stake in the first place. Right. Uh, and then the question is, uh, uh, what would it mean to uh, recognize the way in which we are interdependent, embodied, material beings, uh, and, that, and that that's not a shortcoming, but that's like actually like mm. the highest good, the highest possible life. Is like, what would it mean to like, in practice, uh, organize such a, or like such a way that we actually uh, recognize that as the highest good and do justice to that? Yeah, um, and that's where I mean it gets very interesting because then uh, the argument goes. I mean, I'm doing a terrible injustice to it, but the, the argument goes something like this: um, We're finite beings, and therefore time is what defines us. If time is what defines us, or, I mean, then our, the freedom that we have to use our time um, becomes uh, the greatest. Uh, um, pleasure we could have, right? Or the greatest. Also the freedom to own the question of what it's worth doing. Yeah. Right. Because freedom here is not to be free from all constraints. It's like the freedom is like your ability to recognize yourself in what you do and mm. the institutions on which you depend. But that also requires the, the freedom and the time to engage that question rather than to have to spend all your time just trying to survive. Right. I think you say that the secular life is, is the definition of a secular life is always an economy of time, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, don't, yeah, yeah. Don't do, that's a little unfair, but you say something like that. Um, yeah, but it's important to understand here that, like, I mean, I'm trying to show throughout the book that, like, you can't separate spiritual questions from material questions. You can separate spiritual You life. can't. You can't, yeah. Right. But you also can't separate eco existential from economic questions. So economy here, not understood in the modern sense, but the economy is you know, one closed system whose laws you can study, but rather in a more capacious way. The reason there are economical questions for us, you know, that's ultimately questions about what to prioritize, what is worth doing, uh, and that's why, it, that's an economy of time in deep sense, that because that question can only grip me uh, if I understand that I don't have infinite time to do everything. I mean, there are no economical problems for God, you know, if you're unlimited, there's no, there's no problem with economy. But like, actually, like, uh, all existential questions on a deep level are economical questions because they're about like what we prioritize, what we take to be worth doing with our time, uh, uh, in light of the fact that, that time is finite. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's so the more specific discussion on economy later. So, it's grounded in yeah. that pages. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a wonderful. I mean, I, it's a, the, the it must be eighty or ninety pages on Marx, um, which are which are uh, but demanding for those of us who. who don't have much grounding in Marxist econ economics, I have to say. Um, <laughs> now, I find myself in such general agreement with the book that it's quite difficult for me to play devil's advocate, uh, and I have to appeal to that side of me. I have a side of me, I'm sure that people in the audience have likewise, uh, which is, you know, um, when you're sitting next to the most atheistic person on the plane, uh, you suddenly become quite religious, and then when you're sitting next to the most religious person on the plane, you become quite atheistic, at least I do. Um, so, delving into the religious side of me, um, what if, uh, here might be a sort of, a, a, a fairly standard sort of liberal religious objection to, to your argument, which is, there's a sort of either or logic to your argument. But what about both and? That's to say, what if, um, like many religious people, uh, you have a real commitment to finite life, of course. Um, you know perfectly well that you're going to die at 80 or 90, that the world is finite, um, and that all your commitments in it are finite. Um, and, the, and because you have a fairly relaxed or undefined notion of what eternity is, or perhaps not a notion of eternity at all, um, there is no way in which your religious uh, viewpoint is incompatible uh, with that commitment to uh, to the world around you. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, I, 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 
I, I, there was some radical priest once said to me, you know, we got into an argument and I said, essentially I was doing a version of you, I said, well, the whole eternity thing is just a load of nonsense um, and not desirable anyway, even if it was uh, not nonsense, um, undesirable nonsense. Um, and he said, oh no, you've got it wrong. You, the only way I could be a Christian is by not believing in eternal life. Yeah, I mean, so... Okay. I mean, yeah. you know, I, it's sophistry, but there you go. Yeah, but I mean, why that's, uh, for me, I guess not just sophistry, but genuinely interesting, is because, uh, uh, again, my distinction between the religious and the secular is supposed to give you resources to, to, to ask yourself whether, you know, even if you call yourself religious or Christian, like, what the animating commitment is. Mm -hmm. So if, if that was, I mean, for me, that would be an avowal of this secular faith, as it were, you know? Yeah, I think uh, it was for me too. But similarly, like, it's very important that a lot of thinkers uh, and a lot of philosophical positions that we tend to think of as not religious uh, are actually religious in my sense insofar as we think about our vulnerability and our fragility as something that, like, at least ideally, you should overcome. That can be stoicism, you yep. know? Uh, I mean, one of the definitions I give in the book is that, like, any ideal of being absolved from the pain of loss mm. is a religious ideal. Yeah, and, and that's very true. The Koreanism, the creatures, and so on, are religious in my sense because the highest good for them is a state of being in which you would be invulnerable. Mm. And part of what I'm trying to show is that, like, while vulnerability certainly is painful and inside producing and difficult, it's also the condition of possibility for anything mattering, for anything being at stake. You know, I mean, without you wouldn't be anxious about anything, but you also wouldn't be passionate about anything. That yeah. would be at stake. So that's uh, uh, that's uh, so 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 the uh, the the conception, the religious, what I call the religious understanding of finitude, can can be entertained by a lot of people who think of themselves. As yeah, but would you then? I mean, you you define religious faith, I think, at one point as desirous of converting secularists out of their faith. Could it? be charged that your secular faith is desirous of, of uh, converting religious people out of their religious faith. That's to say, do you then say to, uh, well, let's take an example, my father, let's yeah. say, would you say to my dad, um, look, you have a very fuzzy idea of eternal life and maybe not one at all, um, and a nice commitment to, you know, visiting people in hospital and the like, um, but you should just Bunk the, you get rid of the religious stuff because you're not really a religionist. You're a secularist. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm just the question. I mean, I think writing a book like this and making sorts of arguments I make that's that's uh, not intended to uh, that sort of direct proselytizing. It's mm -hmm. rather about like uh, providing resources. That's why the language of invitation is very important in the book. Providing resources for, to ask yourself, you know, what you actually believe in, what you actually value, you know, what your commitments are. Uh, so that's one aspect of it, uh, and then the other aspect of it is that, uh, uh, and this is why the political emancipation part of it is very important. That like I think that like to actually in practice recognize our life together, this life as the highest good, that's not just like a theoretical matter. It has to do with changing our our practical social conditions mm -hmm. in such a way, uh, you know, because it's not you know I very much acknowledge that of course under present conditions many forms of political organizing, many forms of commitments to justice are like just by virtue of the situations in which people are thrown, you know, are mediated through religious practices. Right. And that's, you know, uh, and, and the point is not necessarily that that's wrong in every situation. The point is about to give an account of like why we are capable of uh, recognizing this life as what we are ultimately committed to, because if that wasn't the case, then no matter how much how emancipated we were, it would always be alienating and fall short because right. it wouldn't liberate us from suffering, it wouldn't liberate us from death. So we have to distinguish between like mm. social forms of suffering that we can be committed to overcome uh, versus the sort of constitutive finitude that is neither possible nor desirable. Okay. Um, 